Good evening, everybody. So my name's Chris Thompson. I am the executive director here at Generator. I see a lot of new faces here, which really excites me. Who here has never been to Generator before? Oh my God. You came to the last one, okay. Great, well welcome. I really appreciate you guys all coming. This is very cool. So um, the, uh, before we do anything else, I want to thank the city of Burlington, who's one of our sponsors. Uh, and of course, I want to uh, thank the Vermont Complex Systems Center, uh, which is, this is a close collaboration between Generator and uh, the Complex Systems Center, and I'm very excited about this. So a couple things, I got a couple announcements before we do anything else. First off, Make sure you've gotten, uh, you've signed up with your email because we're actually going to be sending out coupons for free discounted. Discounted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can see my, my staff going, no, no. <laughs> discounted classes and membership, which is totally cool. Um, okay, two things that are really exciting that are coming up. Next Thursday, which is uh, March 8th, Michael Jagger is going to be speaking here as part of our Jumpstart Entrepreneurship series. Michael Jagger is a, uh, going to be speaking about branding. He's a world famous brand expert. Uh, he helped create the Burton Snowboards brand, the Xbox 360 brand, uh, and this is part of our incredibly successful Jumpstart program uh, where we help people learn how to start a business right from the beginning. And we have a wonderful cohort who are also, we're literally supporting them as they start their business. It's a great program. Uh, so definitely come to that. That's uh, five o'clock next Thursday. And then another super cool program. Um, this is the, uh, uh, it's a global service jam. Next Friday through Sunday, we're gonna have, it's a 48 hour program and we're going to have uh, this is uh, a global program that's happening in 200 other cities at the same time. It's a design thinking challenge, and we're going to have groups come here, and they're going to be working, uh, and it's, uh, there's going to be a prompt that everybody in, in all the 200 cities around the world are going to be doing at the same time. Super cool, and anybody can sign up would be great, because this actually falls, unfortunately, and this is the world's doing this, but for some reason it falls during, um, uh, during spring break. So. All of you guys need to step in for all those students who would be here otherwise, but it's gonna be a great program. I'm really excited about that. Um, so, just quickly. So, this whole thing came out of a discussion that Juniper and I were having. So, I don't know about those of you from, from Burlington. One of my favorite things is when somebody moves to Burlington, we get to talk about all the cool people all the cool projects people are doing, and really this kind of unique thing about Burlington, which is people are incredibly accepting of collaboration, of doing sort of interdisciplinary work, and really it's just, it's kind of, it feels like kind of a, a really unusual place in a lot of ways, and I love sharing that with somebody who's just moved to town. So Juniper and I got together. Juniper actually was one of the founders of the Santa Fe uh, Makerspace, which, you know, but as soon as we got together, we were like, okay, well, you've got to meet this person, you've got to meet that person, you've got to meet that person. And within half an hour, we said, we've got to do a speaker series, right? Because we feel passionately at Generator that innovation and new ideas don't come out of thin air. They, they don't come out from a, you know, a, a, a scientist alone in a lab sort of staring off in his face saying, Eureka, you know, whatever. You know, innovation is a social activity. You know, it comes between about uh, by way of collisions between people in uh, in different disciplines. Uh, you know, the the more disparate, the better. Um, and you know, we immediately Juniper and I thought, what better way of fostering this than having a speaker series where we come together and we get people who are thinking really interesting, big ideas, and we sort of hang out and, and talk about them. Um, so. Thank you, Juniper, so much for, you know, for kicking off this whole idea. And I'd like to turn it over to you so you can introduce Josh. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Chris. We're really excited about this event and this collaboration. It's right in the ethos of complex systems to work across disciplines, and this is exactly what we're hoping to do and inspire some new ideas and collaborations here. So after the talk, we hope that all of you will talk to each other and um, try to be inspired. Um, so it's my honor to be introducing our first speaker of the series. This is a four-part series that'll be going on each month, the last Wednesday of each month. 
Um, and our speaker tonight is Josh Baumgard, and he is the director of the Morphology, Computation, and Evolution Lab. Yeah. And uh, he's a <laughs> in no notes. I was, yeah, and um, he's also a faculty member at the Complex Systems Center, which is a, a great place. And you guys should all come and visit us sometime. Um, and he's just a really interesting and exciting person. So we're really lucky to have him here tonight to talk to us. And he'll be speaking to us about creating safe and autonomous robots. So, Josh. So thank you everyone for coming and thanks to Chris and Juniper for uh, organizing this event and thanks for all of you for coming on a winter evening. A um, couple of notes before I get started. Um, my primary computer died three days ago and I was prepping my talk on my secondary computer this morning and it died. This is my tertiary computer. <laughs> Nobody breathe. Um, Machines are tricky things, and we're going to talk about that uh, today. And to top it all off, I'm having some issues with my voice. Uh, we're halfway through the semester and doing lots of lecturing, so uh, bear with me as we go. I will try my best to adapt as we go. Um, so uh, I want to present uh, for your consideration this evening um, this particular reckless idea, autonomous yet safe uh, machines. Before we get to those kinds of machines, let's go a little ways back to one of the first ideas that our species had, which was this particular machine. So what is a machine? A machine is basically something that takes power, translates it into motion, and that motion has some impact on the world that hopefully is beneficial for one or more people, someone perhaps wielding the machine, possibly not. So what does this possible, what does this machine do? Well, it takes power from human muscle, translates it into, for example, a cutting arc, and has the result of cleaving flesh from bone. That's what this machine does. It doesn't come with an instruction manual, but you can probably figure it out. It's a machine that was a pretty good idea. Uh, it was around for thousands of years with very little change, one of the first machines that our species ever invented. Took a little while, um, but then relatively recently we invented machines like this. This is now an autonomous machine, so it's drawing its power autonomously, turning that power into motion and doing something that's hopefully beneficial to one or more people. What do I mean by uh, autonomous? Well, in this case, there is no one remote controlling uh, this machine. Um, if you've ever been over at the Essex IBM plant, there are a lot of these things on the factory floor and relatively few people uh, around. Um, let me just pause for a minute. I forgot to mention that I'd like this to be as informal as possible, so rather than me just lecturing for the full half hour, please stop me and ask questions or throw in ideas. I'm happy to, to discuss as we go. So we have autonomous uh, industrial robots as a, an autonomous machine. So if someone isn't remote controlling this, how is this machine uh, controlled? Someone wrote code and that code is actually controlling the machine. Hopefully the font is small enough that you can't read this. Some, this is some of my actual code. I see some of my current and former students here, so please don't. Hopefully not. Hopefully there's no go-tos in there. Okay, so, sorry? I enforced indenting, that's it. Okay, let's not get into the space and tabs discussion. We'll be here all night. Okay, all right. We'll move things along. So we have this autonomous machine that isn't directly controlled by a, uh, by a human. It's indirectly controlled by a human because some human wrote this code and the code controls the machine, right? That's an autonomous uh, machine. Again, it's a pretty good idea. It's been around for 30, 40 years, depending on how you count. Uh, it helps us make lots of things very cost effectively. Um, a nice idea, not really a reckless idea. So let's move on to Third machine, this machine, which definitely is a reckless idea, and I feel okay saying it's a reckless idea because I helped to create this machine. It's, adapt it's autonomous and also adaptive at the same time, and this is a challenging thing to do. It's relatively easy to make uh, autonomous machines that are not adaptive. So an industrial robot on the factory floor is programmed to do exactly the same thing over and over again, very quickly and very efficiently. That's what we want these things to do. But there are a lot of areas um, where we might want to deploy a machine that's not just autonomous, but also adaptive. How do we go about creating a machine that's autonomous and adaptive? 
Well, we know of one person that's made untold numbers of autonomous and adaptive machines, and she's been creating them for billions of years, and she is? This is the interact interactive part of the, the lecture? Mother Nature, excellent, okay. So um, myself and my students work in an area of robotics known as evolutionary robotics. And evolutionary robotics is a, a small sort of ecosystem inside the much larger landscape of AI and robotics. And it's one attempt, one of many ways of trying to create machines that are both autonomous and adaptive. So, five minute crash course in evolutionary robotics. We have our machine down here, and we're gonna tell the machine what we want it to do, which in this case is simply cover as much distance as you can in a given period of time. So we tell the machine what we want it to do, move quickly, but we're not gonna tell it, like we did with the industrial robot, we're not gonna tell it exactly how to do it. So we're going to define this function here, the fitness function, which is gonna take as input any given machine, measure the distance that machine travels, and assign the resulting number, which might be two feet, four feet, eight feet, assign that number to that particular machine. So here's evolutionary robotics in action. We're gonna start by having the machine run this simulation. So we're gonna evolve some robots, but we're gonna evolve them in simulation. This is a bit of a cartoon example, but it's here to give you sort of an idea of how this works. We have our physical machine, and it's thinking about, or it's simulating populations of robots. In this particular case, we had 16 robots. Some of them are in a, a traffic jam over here. Some have walked off the edge of the screen. We have two at the top, which maybe you'll be able to see a little bit better if I replay this. Some of these move a little bit quicker than others. So the computer is watching all 16 robots and is gonna assign a fitness value to each of these 16 robots, which is how far it travels in the 10 seconds that this video runs for. Okay, in this particular point in time, all 14 are going to be deleted. These 14 that move relatively slowly are deleted. The two relatively quickly moving machines at the top of the screen survive, and they produce 14 copies of themselves. And when they produce those 14 copies, the computer introduces a mistake in the copying process. Why the heck would you ever write a computer program that intentionally makes mistakes? It's an evolutionary system, right? So those mistakes are the computerized equivalent of a mutation operator, a mutation event. So the 14 children of these two parents move similarly to the two parents, but a few of them might actually move even faster than their parents. And Mother Nature, unfortunately, sometimes is quite cruel. You know what happens to the parents. The children produce offspring of their own. And if we run this for long enough, we eventually get a machine that moves relatively quickly without us having to program that machine directly. We write the evolutionary code, give it to the computer, and the computer evolves robots for us. So this is all high tech, but it's not really that different from what our ancestors have been doing for a very long time. Our ancestors domesticated dogs from wolves and corn from Teosente. You select the thing that you like, you don't select the ones you don't like, and you let evolution do what it does best. So that's autonomous and adaptive machines. We can then take the best evolved machine, and now the computer, the robot takes that best solution and tries it out in reality. And this is what evolution came up with. How is this robot doing? A couple nods, a couple of... Uh, it's doing its best. We actually worked on this project for three years, and it took a long time to get all these pieces. There's lots more pieces that I don't have time to go into today. We worked on this for three years. When this robot finally got up and moved from the left side of the table to the right side of the table, there were like three or four of us in the lab. It was three in the morning. It went absolutely crazy and cheering. There was an undergraduate student that was sitting at another table who had nothing to do with this project. He turns around and looks at what's going on. He says, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> For better or worse, that's the name that's stuck, so welcome to the world of the evil starfish. Yes? How do you identify which place, which variable to use for the error? Which? Uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, well, obviously you have to decide what place to make an error. Oh, what place to make an error. Exactly. Well, you 
have lots of options. Yes, that's a good question. So the question is, where do we, let me back up a little bit. Where do we introduce the error? So in this case, we have 16 robots. Inside each of the 16 robots is a brain. There's a neural network controller running each of these 16 robots. When we copy the robot, we copy its body and the brain. And the computer picks a random place in the robot's brain and makes a random change at that random place. It's not a variable that's being identified. It's all random, right? Like Mother Nature, it's just blind chance. That's it. And most of those errors make the robots move more slowly or not move at all. And every once in a while, that random change makes the robot move a little more quickly. Make sense? Yes. Theodore. Uh, you're doing this with the ones that move the furthest? Yes. You selected those. Select the ones that move the furthest. Yep. Have you ever run trials on the ones that didn't move the furthest and, and uh, germinate those? To, yeah. uh, yes. So sometimes you might want to keep the, the ones around that don't move as fast. It might be a good idea to have some diversity in your population, right? As a society, we're talking about genetic engineering and monocultures. You might want to guard against monocultures in robots in the same way that you might want to in crops. It's a very good question. Um, we spend a whole semester talking about these kinds of issues in a class I teach at UVM on exactly this, evolutionary robotics. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of touch on this idea and give you the basics of how this works because we're going to use this evolutionary system to produce, to produce these machines. And why are we using evolution to do this? Well, remember, we're doing so because we want to produce not just autonomous machines, machines that teach themselves to walk, but adaptive machines. So what happens if something goes wrong with the robot? And if you look carefully in the bottom right video, you'll notice that the four-legged robot is now a three-and-a-half-legged robot. We sent in a PhD student with a screwdriver and they mechanically separated the lower part of one of the robot's legs, which when I play the video, you'll see it dragging along behind it. The robot has no pain receptors, so no, no robot cruelty here, I promise. There's cruelty, it just doesn't know it's being performed on itself. The robot has no pain sensors, it has no camera, it can't see the fact that a leg has, has been removed, but something has changed. So one of the nice things about evolution... There's two tilt sensors. So the tilt sensors tell the robot that suddenly now I'm tilting a little bit more to the right than I used to before. That's it, that's it. So what does the robot do? It adapts. The fitness is still distance. Keep moving no matter what. So now our three and a half legged robot comes up with a different way of moving given its injury. And when it tries it out in reality, sometimes gets it right. Now you can really see the evil starfish in, in action. So we published this work about 10 years ago and when we talked to reporters the inevitable question about Terminator and Arnold Schwarzenegger came up and all that sort of thing, right? Machine that just keeps going, which is fine, but we are here today to talk not just about autonomous and adaptive machines, but also safe machines. One of the things you might have noticed when you watch these videos is that this four-legged robot doesn't move like a four-legged animal does. It comes up with a different way of moving, which for most people when they see these videos the first time is a little bit surprising. Right? So this is part of the problem with safe machines is it's okay to surprise us some of the time when we're dealing with a machine like this, but a machine that's in very close proximity to you and may weigh five times as much as you do, you don't want it to surprise you. Right? Okay. So that's autonomous and adaptive machines where we basically come up with this fitness function. We give the computer a way of measuring how good a given robot is. I just showed you the fitness function for distance. Let's give a different robot a different fitness function, which is open the door and go through it. This is some work by uh, one of my colleagues. The robot will successfully open the door and go through it. You're laughing now, but if you had been on the other side of that door... Okay, so 
This, from the robot's point of view, the robot has done exactly what we asked it to do, right? You said go open the door and go through it. Perfect. No problems, right? So this robot is particularly perhaps entertaining, but also unsafe, because not only did it do something wrong, it doesn't know that it did something wrong. And this is a particular, any human who does something wrong, it doesn't even realize they did something wrong. This is a dangerous human being. Same thing goes for machines. So this is why autonomous and adaptive machines are literally reckless ideas. I would not suggest that we try and deploy these machines in outdoor environments. You don't want drones using this technology to deliver packages to your front doorstep. You don't want these machines anywhere near human beings for this reason. This is a problem that's known in robotics now as perverse instantiation. Just a fancy word for saying that it instantiated what we wanted it to do, but it did it perversely in a way that in retrospect we definitely did not want it to do it, right? Okay, that's autonomous and adaptive machines, but we want autonomous machines, adaptive machines. We, don't want, we want autonomy. We don't have to, I want to program every robot to do exactly what we want it to do. We want them to be adaptive. They want, we want them to be able to change what they do if circumstances change, but we also want them to be safe. We want to guard against this issue of perverse instantiation. How do we do that? The short answer is nobody knows yet, but I'm going to show you a few approaches that are out there and a particular approach we're pursuing in my research group. Okay. First solution is separate people from machines. When we in invented industrial robots and started to put them in factories, one of the first things they did was make sure that the humans that were working in the factory didn't go anywhere near the industrial robots unless they absolutely had to. Um, Western Europe is now pushing through some legislation to allow autonomous trucks onto highways uh, in Western Europe. And the idea is they're going to basically delineate certain lanes on highways that no human driver is allowed to go into. So they're turning parts of the highway system in Europe into basically a factory. It's a part of the world in which only machines are going to operate. Now, whether this actually becomes a reality and whether it becomes widespread, again, is a matter of policy and culture. We'll see what happens. But that's one relatively straightforward technical solution to creating autonomous and adaptive and uh, safe machines. Keep people and machines separated. However, it might work well for autonomous cars, but again, if you want drones to de deliver packages right to your doorstep, or we might want machines that can help uh, elderly people in their homes, you're going to have robots that have to be, by definition, in close physical proximity to people. So this approach is not going to work. What else can we do? One approach is to try and demonstrate to the machine what we would like it to do, and then the machine sort of learns from that demonstration and maybe adapts, but it doesn't go very far off script. It does more or less what we showed it to do which is okay, and again, that works very well in domains like um, robot surgery, where a surgeon actually moves uh, the robot surgeon, and the robot surgeon might, uh, it might improvise a little bit, but not too much. Works well there. But again, very, uh, very uh, task intensive. Takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of specialists, takes lots of training for the machines to be able to do this. And how do you demonstrate to a drone how to deliver a package to every possible home and condo and rental unit that's, that's out there, right? This approach doesn't scale up very well to a lot of tasks. So we can't always separate people and machines. We can't always show them directly what we want them to do. What else can we do? Well, I'm going to show you now what we're trying to do in my lab, which is go back to this idea of telling the robot what we want it to do, but not how to do it. But we've already seen there's some issues there. So let's tell the robot, go through the door, but go through the door safely. How's that going to work out? Define safely. Give me a number. You need a safety function. We haven't fixed the problem at all, right? We need to define safety mathematically, right? Give me an equation for safety. There are some of my colleagues that are working on that, that believe we can somehow mathematically define in a certain number of environments exactly what a machine should and shouldn't do. Personally, I don't think that's going to work very well because you go back to situations like this where at least now in math you're trying to demonstrate what you should and shouldn't be doing. 
Question? Comment? What about, uh, you know, I, hate to, I hate to go back to the masters, but what about the Asimov's three laws? That seems to work for their primary claim. Go read all of Asimov's books, and he covered 547 ways in which the three laws don't work, or however many. I think actually in retro, they're, I love those books, um, and they raise a, yeah, who doesn't, who doesn't? They raise a good point, which is interpret those laws, right? So what exactly do those laws mean? How, what do they mean on the ground in different situations? So you can think of this as a version of Asimov's laws, if you like, right? Be safe, right? Protect humans at all costs, and if there's time, protect yourself, but you're less important, and so on. But it's still, you need a mathematical description of exactly what you mean by that. And if you don't, you're going to get robots that open the door and go through the door. They do exactly what Asimov's laws said, but not in the way we would have liked the machine to do it. So, how do we escape from this trap? Again, this is just one way of doing it, but we're going to try and define now safety as in a way that humans will approve of. Okay. Have we made any progress here? I don't know. Now, um, what we're going to do is say humans approve of it. How could we actually operationalize this? Or is there a way we could turn this into something that we can actually measure? So let's try and do that. You may agree with me, you may not, but let's see what we can do. Imagine we have our evil starfish again, and people come up with what they would want the robot to do. In this case, we have two people, and they all tell the robot, move. That's what we want you to do. They say it in language, not in math. They literally say M-O-V-E to the robots. And the robot hears M-O-V-E and just does this. How did the robot do? Did it move in a way in which people would approve of? Hands up if you think the robot is moving. Let's vote. It's a democracy, right? Okay, looks pretty unanimous. So what does the robot hear after it heard M-O-V-E and said, what about this? It heard back praise. praise. It got back unanimous thumbs up. Okay. The robot says, great, I'm making progress. How about this? Still here is move. Is the robot moving? I don't see any hands going, a couple hands? I, now there's disagreement, right? So what does this mean, right? So there's a mixed message here. Let's assume that most people said no. There might be a few yeses, but the robot said, generally speaking, that was not me obeying the command move. The first thing I did was, remember that this robot doesn't know English, it doesn't know language at all. All it knows is M-O-V-E, I do this, I get this, I hear M-O-V-E, I do that, and I get that. That's all the robot knows for the moment. It's collecting some raw material. That's phase one. Phase two is it's going to take all that raw material and it's going to do some machine learning. It's going to try and find relationships between three things. Language, M-O-V-E, action, what it actually did, and when the robot is moving, like when you move, it can feel what's happening, so it gets sensation back. It's going to try and connect language, sensation, and social response, these thumbs up and thumbs down. It's going to try and find relationships between these three things. I'll show you that phase two in a moment, but how do we actually do this in practice? This is just a cartoon. And obviously, we would like for these machines to be safe, to actually find connections between these three things, is we're going to need a lot of training data. This is not enough. So how do we scale this up to hundreds of robots, thousands of people, and tens of thousands of yeses and noes? <laughs> Twitch, someone's already jumped ahead here. This is the Twitch Plays Robotics project. Um, this is running on the web right now. If you Google Twitch Plays Robotics, you can find it and you can do exactly what we just did um, metaphorically. So what happens in Twitch Plays Robotics? Well, first of all, let me start with Twitch. Does everybody know what Twitch is? Some of the younger people, okay. Twitch.tv is one of the most popular websites in the world that maybe you haven't heard of. Millions of people every day, actually 9.7 million people per day, go and watch other people play video games. Amazing. One of my former students, Shane Seelis, turned me on to Twitch. I, I didn't believe him at first, but it's real. Okay. Within the Twitch universe, there are a number of Twitch channels where 
Different people play different video games. They live stream themselves playing the game to the website, and then people watch them play the video game and comment on the game. They swear at the streamer. They swear at each other. It's the internet, right? It's the wild, wild west. Okay. There are a series of channels called Twitch Plays X, and in the Twitch Plays X channels, the chatters are not passive observers, but active participants. So in a Twitch Plays X channel, there is no human player. There is just some video game running, and over in chat, three people might type in A, and two people might type in B. Three votes for A, two votes for B, so the computer treats that as the collective pressing the A button on the game console. So together, everyone who's watching the channel is playing the game together. They're voting in real time on what the game character does next. That's Twitch Plays X, and there's a whole bunch of them. Twitch Plays Pokemon, Twitch Plays, you name it, it's out there. So we tried to build on that meme by making Twitch plays robotics, and as you can see here, instead of streaming a video game, we stream our evolving simulated robots to the web. People are watching these robots in real time and doing basically what we just said. So there's two things that they can do here. First of all, in the upper right, in the upper right panel there, and it may be a, okay, there we go. In the upper right panel there, people can type in language, commands, or things that they want to try and teach the robot. So at the moment, one person is voted for crawl forward in the top right panel there. And so people are trying to decide what, these, what to issue the, the robot as a command. We tell our users to think of these robots as pets. There are certain things that these robots may be able to learn, and many, many more things that they probably can't learn but we don't know which is which. The game is for you to figure this out. So let's see if I can reload this. Okay, at this point, the command down in the bottom right is so close. Is the robot obeying the command so close? I don't know, hard to, hard to say. If we wait a little bit, we'll see that the command crawl forward or move forward is issued to the robot, and I apologize for the connectivity issues here. If we watch for a little while, you'll see in the bottom right there, you'll start to see some yes votes and some no votes. Those are the robots giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down to the current robot under the current command. So now we have a cyber infrastructure. We have a web platform in which we can recruit hundreds of these Twitch users to teach hundreds of robots, hundreds of commands using thousands of these signals, yes or no. You'll notice that they're issuing commands like crawl forward and walk forward. Um, I won't go into the nitty gritty details of this experiment, but our robots so far have been able to learn what M-O-V-E means. They've learned what J-U-M-P means. They've learned what M-O-V-E space L-E-F-T means. Someone, uh, a crowd of uh, users issued the command to the robot, um, prove for Matt's last theorem. Robots haven't figured that one out yet. Um, someone else issued the command to the robot, be yourself. <laughs> so is this particular robot obeying the command, be yourself? Maybe, I don't know, right? Kind of interesting. Okay, so that's Twitch Plays Robotics. That's the game, if you like, but we're trying to deal with the serious issue of building autonomous yet safe machines. So how does this relate back to safety? Do you have another study from the humanities analyzing the people that are abusing the poor robots? <laughs> we would love to get a social scientist involved because there's some very interesting social dynamics that go on on Twitch Plays Robotics. One of them, like we could be here all night, I'll tell you just one Twitch Plays Robotics story. When we first launched this experiment two years ago now, a small group of users in the chat window said, hey, what is this? Someone said, oh, some scientist is trying to train robots to do something. They said, come back at 11 p.m. And then they left, and I was like, what's going on at 11 p.m.? Went to sleep, didn't pay any attention to it, came back the next day. They had come at 11 p.m. and set up a subreddit. So they had gone to another social media site where they organized and they said, here are very, four very, very bad words. 
And we're going to issue these bad words to the robot. And whenever we issue the first bad word and the robot goes left, give it a thumbs up. When we issue the second bad word and the robot goes right, give it a thumbs up. So they actually successfully trained the robot to go left, right, forward, and back in response to definitely not those four words. My poor student, when she had to write up this paper, for, so we used a lot of asterisks, but it was the exact social dynamics that we were looking for. People spontaneously got together and said, we're going to teach the robot, we're going to be uh, concise and considerate, we're going to collaborate. It was all great, except for the four very bad words. Question. Are, are you using a simplified language? Because the problem with move is, it can mean go from here to there, uh. or you're just legal. Exactly. What exactly does move mean? And move is a good one because, as you saw in the second case there, not everyone said that was not movement, right? So language is not math. It's a little bit imprecise, right? So this is a bit of an issue. Remember that we're letting the crowd decide what to teach the robot. So often they will come up with vague things like be yourself or move, or sometimes they'll switch and say move forward move back. So often it's not the robots learning from people, it's people learning from the robots, right? In retrospect, move is overly vague, so let's be a little bit more specific, which is exactly what we want, right? We're trying to sharpen what we tell the robots what, what we want. Question in the back. How does the robot process the thumbs up or thumbs down? It doesn't receive value. <coughs> Receive reward. That's it? Okay, exactly. So how does it, what does Y and N or yes and no mean to this robot? It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have language. There's no reward or punishment. That's phase two. So it, in phase one, it's just collecting all of this information, right? All of these commands, all of this uh, reinforcement, and all of these sensations, right? The simulated robot in its simulated world can feel what's happening when it moves. We're, I'm now going to describe phase two, which is how it learns to connect language, action, and social response. Okay, so what are you looking at here? Well, one of the robots we use in Twitch Plays Robotics is Wormbot, which you see here. Okay, and each dot here corresponds to one 30 second action that the Wormbot performed when issued the command jump. It heard lots of other commands, but we filtered out from this huge data set. Every single time that the worm bot heard the command J-U-M-P. Remember, it doesn't know what J-U-M-P means. For each one of those dots, we plotted its position according to these two axes. So the horizontal axis, the horizontal position of any green dot, has to do with the experience, the physical experience the robot had. So if you're able to read here at the front, the horizontal distance is the fraction of time during that 30 second period that the robot spent on the ground. Points that are to your left, the robot spent very little time on the ground, and points to your right, those were times in which the robot spent most of its time on the ground. The vertical position of each dot is social response. So um, if you look at that dot there, that dot is a positive uh, greater than zero, its height is above zero, which means it got more uh, upvotes than downvotes. This dot up here, that dot at the top there, which has a vertical height of one, everyone was unanimous. In that case, either there were two people watching and it got two thumbs up, or there were three people watching, three thumbs up, 17 people watching, 17 thumbs up. Unanimous, positive. This dot down here has a, a height of minus one, unanimous negative reinforcement. Everybody said, that's not jump. Make sense? Dots that lie along the center there at height zero, that was one thumbs up and one thumbs down, or six up, six down. So horizontal position of a dot is what the robot felt. And the vertical position is what the robot got in social response after the fact. That's it. That's what we're plotting here. Now the machine learning part comes in, the AI part. So the AI part is trying to take this dotted line that you see here, this straight line, and it's trying to apply this straight line so that it's as close 
to all of these green dots as possible. It's not able to do a very good job because these dots are sort of spread around, but it's trying to find a relationship. That's what that dashed line represents. If you can remember back to your high school math, y equals mx plus b, we're trying to fit this straight line to the data. And that's what the AI came up with. It said that dotted line is as close as I can get. I can get this line to as, as close to all these dots as possible. If you can still remember your high school math, you'll notice that this line has negative slope. It's going up and to the left and down and to the right. What does that mean to the robot? The longer it spends on the ground, the further the dot is to the right, the more thumbs down it's going to get. So this is how the robot learns the connection between these three things. The robot doesn't understand English. All it knows, if you were to ask this robot, what does J-U-M-P mean? Instead of getting into a philosophical debate about meaning of words and all that, we can, the robot at least can be very precise. J-U-M-P means this. The, the dotted line, that's what it means. When I do these things, I, the crowd reacts in this way. That's what it means. Okay, so now this robot understands, in this case, has found a connection between these three things. What does that have to do with safety? Can, I, can we just ask one more question? About sure. The there is a huge number of unanimous votes spread all the way across yeah. the, the spectrum. Absolutely. Is, that, is the data really that ugly? I mean, really that bad? Ab absolutely, it's that ugly. So if you had turned around and watched the hands when I said, was that second video, was that second simulated robot moving? There were no hands, then a few hands went up, then a couple went down, and then some people said yes, some people said no. Absolutely, right? The crowd is messy. We're not all in agreement about what exactly move means, what jump means, what be yourself means. It is extremely messy, which is important because if we're going to try and use this to create safe machines, it means the machines might not always get it right. Okay. Let's try and think about how we can use this to try and make safe robots. Let's imagine we take this dotted line, we drop it in our evil starfish, and the evil starfish goes out into the world, and as it's walking around, it comes in contact with a human, and the human points at the robot and says, J-U-M-P. And the robot says, okay, I'm supposed to jump. I've never been in this environment before, so now I have to rely on the adaptive part of me. Remember, this is an adaptive machine. It can't always do exactly the same thing. It can't pick one of these green dots. They're not available. It has to do something. So the robot does something, and imagine that whatever it does, it spends all its time on the ground. Let's imagine that it's standing on somebody's lawn, so there's soft earth and grass. It's actually hard for the robot to jump. It tries to do something, and it never leaves the ground. The robot knows before the human responds, that the human is not going to be happy, right? Because if you take the red line and you look to see where it intersects with the black line, go over here, the robot actually thinks it's going to get more than unanimous no votes, which is impossible, but it at least knows that it hasn't J-U-M-P'd. Whatever J-U-M-P is, it hasn't done it, right? Imagine further that we have the evil starfish, and remember it's able to think about things, it's able to generate these ideas. So maybe the starfish listens to the person and hears J-U-M-P. It creates a simulation of soft earth and grass, and it does this action which re results in it not leaving the ground. The, the physical robot has not even moved an inch yet. It's just thinking. And it says that action is dangerous. Dangerous in the sense that if I were to carry it out in reality, the humans would say, that was terrible. You went through the door, but not in the way that I would have wanted you to go through the door. Bad dog, bad dog exactly. <laughs> it's too late, though, right? If the robots rise up and they do something very bad, there may not be anyone around to say bad dog. So we want them to be able to predict beforehand how people will respond after it's carried out the action. That's the connection between language, action, and social response. As I mentioned, that's just one approach to realizing safety. Question? So does it know uh, beforehand that it can't leave the ground? And it actually, if it's on the grass, and it's, does it already know that it's going to have difficulty? 
That's a very good question. So does it know that it's going to have difficulty leaving the ground? Maybe it knows nothing about soft earth to begin with, right? So we have the other part, the uh, adaptive and autonomous part. So maybe the robot spends a little bit of time learning about the environment that it's in. I showed you the evil starfish when it loses a leg. It's never experienced that situation before, so it takes it a while to adapt and say, okay, I know what's going on. I'm limping, I have three and a half legs. It may be walking and saying, it's not the fact that I'm missing a leg, but I happen to be walking on a surface which is pretty pliable or soft, right? So it might have to learn about grass and soft materials first before it's able to, to do that. I kind of glossed over that, that detail. Good question. Okay, so that's an approach to safety. And again, this is just pure science, pure speculation, just something we're trying in the lab. This is not something we're going to release into the wild anytime soon. So purely an academic pursuit, literally and metaphorically. But it matters. These approaches to AI safety matter because society is already asking or demanding that we create autonomous machines that are also safe. So uh, the United Nations now holds an annual meeting, and the most recent meeting was uh, last November in Geneva. This was a meeting about lethal autonomous weapon systems. The UN loves acronyms. It's LAWS, or otherwise known as killer robots. They did not pick the LAWS acronym arbitrarily. They want to create laws. They want to create legislation against autonomous and adaptive yet unsafe machines. That's what the UN or a lot of legislative bodies at all levels of government would like to do, but they're having a very hard time doing that because what do you legislate, right? If you think about other dangerous technologies like, for example, nuclear technology, there is a particular measurement that you can make which the global community is generally converging on is uh, millisieverts. And I'm not going to get into the details of what that is, but according to certain international bodies, 50 millisieverts per year is a maximum safe dose. Above that number, and from a legal point of view, you're in trouble. You may not be in health trouble yet, but if you're an employee working in a business where you're absorbing more than 50 millisieverts, that company is liable for a lawsuit, right? So we have a dangerous, potentially dangerous technology, nuclear, uh, nuclear technology. We've come up with a metric, and then the legislatures, legislators can get involved and decide what that number should be, right? It's not about the scientists anymore. As Chris mentioned, creating safe AI is not something that just scientists can do in their lab. We need to work together. How do scientists and legislatures and the public in general decide not only what is a safe machine, but how do we measure safety, and what should the maximum cap be? So, uh, we also have this for carbon monoxide. You take whatever you want. There is some number, there's some measurement and some maximum value that legislative bodies use when they decide whether a situation is safe or unsafe for human beings. This is the current state for AI uh, safety. You can actually go and read the uh, transcripts from these UN annual meetings. There's a lot of discussions with scientists and philosophers and engineers about what AI safety is, and no one has decided on what to actually measure. We could measure the number of deaths and injuries, but that is not what we do in other uh, realms of technology for obvious reasons. We'd like to catch something before it harms or kills a human being. So, for your consideration, our proposal for a measurement is the prediction, the percent of prediction accuracy. You need to have an autonomous and adaptive machine that can predict into the future. What is it predicting? It's trying to predict social response. What will people think in the future? If I do this, when I was asked to do that. That's what I propose as a measurement. Now, what the actual percent value should be, that's something we as a society should decide. Social response is also a vague term, because when I say social, who are we talking about? Are we talking about the 14 Twitch users that helped to teach the robot jump? Maybe not. Does the robot need to be able to accurately predict 10 people? A hundred people, a thousand people, 50 women, 50 men, 50 people of color, 50 Caucasians. Who should be in that social group? What's the composition of that social group? How big should it be? 
And how good should the machine be able to do it, predicting the social response of that group for different situations and different commands? Looks simple, but obviously there's still a lot of work uh, to be done. Um, but this is something that we're thinking about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the subject. Thank you very much. Way in the back there. Yeah. To what degree is uh, social response uh, sort of a factor? To what degree is social response sort of a, a factor of the intention of the social actors? Okay. Um, so, be, because I mean, let's let, let's say we had say ISIS or Al Qaeda. Okay. Uh, they put together an autonomous robot that's intended to kill like hundreds of people. Sure they're going to get a positive social response for that from that relevant group, but not from others. Absolutely, right? So this is, a, this is a democratic system. For a certain group, they may come up with a certain command and unanimously, positively reinforce that, that system. So you could take something that is safe according to a certain group of social actors, and it is deemed unsafe by another group, what you're hoping is that the larger group is the one which is intent on preserving human life and other general values that that larger group holds. It may not be unanimous, and there may be other social groups that disagree with that. And again, we're no longer in the area of technology or robotics. This is now a social and cultural issue. So I told you the story about the group of bad actors, or bad from my point of view, who got together and organized. What was it? That part two of that story is they organized, and for two days they were able to successfully teach the robot those four bad words, until the daytime users of Twitch started to wonder what was going on and cottoned on, and then the good guys, again from my point of view, guys and girls, got together and said, hey, these people are trying to teach the robot bad words. Let's get online, and every time one of them tries to reinforce the robot under that bad word, do the opposite of what the bad person does. If they give a thumbs up, give a thumbs down, which makes, which makes the training data, data more messy, right? Because now you're basically the good guys were trying to blur the data being generated by the bad guys, making it harder and harder for the robot to mean what that bad word actually means. So the only way there was a good ending to that story is there happened to be more good guys and girls than bad guys and girls. And if we scale this up to larger and larger social groups, I would hope that that would also hold up. <laughs> However, again, we can then move into a political discussion, which will maybe set aside for this evening. Yes. Bring up this, this story of 2001's hell, right? Okay. He had mixed messages and he couldn't take it. Right? He, he, he got mixed he, messages, he, exactly. He went off the rails. So. Your robots to get mixed messages. They get mixed messages, and what happens when they get a mixed message? So if you look at this plot for a moment, and I wish I'd brought the other slide now, but imagine that the, uh, imagine that the red dotted line went here. If you place the red dotted line there, it actually passes through low green dots and high green dots. So it says, wait a second, I've done something like this twice before. From the robot's point of view, I've done this before twice. Once everyone said, good job, and the other time everyone said, terrible job, right? The robot is uncertain. It's getting literally mixed messages. So what the robot really does is when it's considering a new action, it's looking at the spread of these points along the vertical axis, which is basically the robot's uncertainty about people. And the robot shies away from those areas. It says, you've asked me to do something, I've come up with something, I've come up with an idea, and I have no idea what you guys are gonna say about that. So we tell the robot, stay away from those things. You mentioned value before. We put values into the robot, which is don't do anything unless you're absolutely certain that you're going to get a unanimous or close to unanimous positive result. Yep. Um, I'm just sort of wondering how you handle the fallibility of the majority. We don't. That's it. The, if the crowd, in general, votes one way, that's it. The best we can do, if you're 
the best we can do is what is most people think is the right thing to do. I don't, if, if we can do something better than that, I would, I would love to hear it. This is what we call democratic AI. It just is based on the majority vote of the social group. And as we know, sometimes the social group unanimously votes for something that in retrospect, maybe they wish they hadn't. So that, um, I, I appreciated you bringing up the evolution of responses in that regard, that okay. the majority might change. And it seems like in the inertia of that response lies some of the, the difficulties, like with things like DDT, we thought things were once very beneficial and then it changed on a dime. So I'm interested in how you might conceive of handling that inertia. I, I think, again, I don't know how, right? It's hard, we're not, we can't tell the future, right? So maybe, again, as a society, we decide, let's not try and teach the robot this command yet. Let's instead try and teach it this. So I was telling you the story about how on Twitch Plays Robotics, people mentioned move at the beginning and then saw that they were getting strained, there wasn't a good agreement among people on what move was, so the crowd sharpened the command. They started issue move forward, right? So you're right, we can't, you know, we, we can't see into the future. We might make a decision collectively as a group about machines, and those machines may end up proving us wrong. But hopefully, if we are able to watch the machines and learn what they think J-U-M-P means, or deliver this package safely means, we can start to refine and sharpen what we say, and how we respond to different ideas the machines come up with. What kind of roles do you think uh, these evolutionary robotics can fill? Because you have the really clearly defined um, that are great for automation lines. You have mm. the, the ones that you mentioned where you teach them how to do something where they might be good for surgery. And then you have these which take more social input. What kind of things do you think would fill that role? That's a good question. So there are lots of different approaches to teaching robots and evolutionary robotics is just one. And it has the advantage of that it often comes up with something we might not have thought of, which is great. It might come up with an even safer way to do something than, than we had thought of, but also it also comes up with ideas that are surprising in a bad way. So I think where evolutionary robotics is useful is sort of as a test bed to try out these ideas where the machines are actually teaching people, right? So when we issue a command to the robot, and the robots evolve not just one solution, but as evolution usually does, gives us back a huge ecosystem of different ideas, a whole bunch of different robots with different, different behaviors, we start to learn about what we really meant when we said, X. So evolutionary robotics is a nice exploratory tool because it shows us all the ways in which machines might try and obey what we ask them to do. We might use that to refine very carefully what we ask the machines to do and then use a different machine learning method which is much more uh, constrained, much more safe. So I think it's going to be a combination of these different kinds of approaches. <laughs> Getting your exercise today. There you go. So, so if I'm reading the, the chart with the different responses, and I think it was least squares fit. Yes, correct. Could you, could you then, thinking about the way you're talking about thresholds for whether you, you need to have a, a, a percentage that approve it, right. if you get to a point where it, it does a simulation that says I'm going to be somewhere in the middle and, I'm, and I do my fit, Right. It could then calculate a percentage that I think I'm 70% I'm likely to be, get approval on this. That's exactly what it is, right? So you can derive from right. this mathematical mo model, this dash line, exactly what its prediction accuracy is. Right. It's that percentage, right? So it can say jump, I'm only going to get 70%. I'm not going to do anything. It could say, given what you guys told me about this thing, J-U-M-P, this is the best I can do, right? right? So unless you can refine, you know, the, the machine might say, we might say, that's not good enough, right? 65% is not good enough. So let's wipe the board reissue a different command, maybe enlarge the, the group of social actors, and let's try, try and do a better job. Let's actually come up with something that we can tell the robot where the green dots lie along the line. And now the machine says, thank you very much. Now I know what you mean. Now I can get 93% prediction accuracy. Then we might allow these things out into the wild. So this is not set in stone, right? Again, people are lear can learn from the machines, so we might be able to clean up the signals people are giving machines through this feedback loop. That's the idea. 
Um, so can't you, I mean, it seems simplistic, but you know, they're trying to, in Europe, have uh, trucks drive autonomously. So can't you just set very strict limits? I mean, I don't know if you'd call this a kind of math, but you'd say, if I was to be really simplistic, the truck can go zero miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, or 40 miles an hour. Okay. Along a track. Yep. You know, maybe it's even like a kind of train, but wouldn't that be perfectly safe? I, you, 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 there, in other words, you wouldn't ever let it get above 40 miles an hour. You might not get to your destination if somebody does something such that it only goes zero miles an hour, but it would still be safe. That's a very good point. So we, and definitely that will be part of whatever solution we come up with for autonomous and safe machines is to put very strict constraints on the things they can do. The trucks can go zero, 20, or 40 miles an hour, which works well for trucks and works well for autonomous cars in which you, there are four things you can do. You can turn left, turn right, speed up, or slow down, more or less. Imagine a machine that's trying to help an elderly person in their home, and it might be help, trying to help that elderly person put their clothes on, right? They're in literal physical, physical proximity and possibly touching uh, the human stakeholder. There are many things the robot might do. It might have to have relatively complex appendages to help with putting on clothes. And there are many, many things. So what, what would be the three safe things that that robot can do? It's not a simple matter of 0, 20, or 40 miles per hour anymore. Once you have a complex machine like us, there's basically an infinite number of actions that the machine can perform. And how do you a priori say, these are all unsafe and these are safe? Exactly. And this has been one of the fundamental problems with robotics for so long. So computers and robotics were both invented in the Second World War, and we've done pretty well with computers, right? This is almost, almost a solved problem. Computers are super easy because they do the same thing over and over again. But robots, at least the ones that we would like to move about in our environments, we've made so little progress because of the reason you mentioned, right? There's an infinite number of things, almost an infinite number of things that you could do right now, movements that you could carry, carry out. So we can't a priori rule some of them out, right? The only thing we can do is let the crowd collectively decide on what these safe limits are. So okay. I was wondering, um, how do you tell uh, a robot via the social actors, don't do this uh, on the fly? Because we talk about, uh, you know, you have in the system, it says, don't do these things because this many people said it. But what if uh, they do something and on the fly is like, don't do that. And I'm just wondering, how do we get those commands to the robots? Is it voice command? Is it, you know, what kind of communication system is that, it? That's a good question. So in robotics, so the question is, what do we do about allowing someone on the fly to say, don't do that? So this is known as the big red button problem in AI, right? So where is that button? Is it a voice command? Is, it, is there someone always watching the robot through video feed? You know, would we ever consider allowing a machine to be almost 100% autonomous and not have the red button or not have someone's hand over the big red button? I don't know. Again, this is a policy issue. Right? If you think about the example of the robot taking care of an elderly person in their home, if that person starts to fall and the robot is close enough, the robot should probably, if it's capable of doing so, it should try and catch the person before they hit the ground. There isn't time for someone to watch and decide what the robot should do. Now, that's a tricky situation because we've already decided as a society to let autonomous robots help people in their homes. We've now opened the door to those kind of situations. There are situations in which the robot is going to have to act quickly. This might be all that we have to go on. And if the robot isn't sure, then maybe it should default to doing nothing. But in a lot of situations, doing nothing is possibly the worst thing you can do. So the answer is there's no easy answer to, to your question. It's a, really, it's a really good one. Thank you. The which? Court. Court. 
Um, so I really like the idea that you uh, mentioned earlier about cyber infrastructure and okay. the use of Twitch for like crowdsourcing these um, data sets. But um, I was curious about if, when you're trying to get a social response that's on a huge scale, and we have whole countries that have such low civic engagement just for electing leaders, um, what are other avenues for sort of crowdsourcing that data in such a large way? I, I have no idea. All I know is that Twitch attracts 9.7 million people a day. And they are voting pretty much 24-7. Not everyone likes to watch other people play video games. So how could you involve, again, a very diverse group of social actors in something like this? If we were to decide as a group that this would be a good approach to AI safety, I don't know. It's a good, good question. Could we gamify this or create a system like this that would appeal to a wider audience than just Twitch users? Yeah, I'm thinking about like the, the CAPTCHAs where you have to prove I'm not a robot and that's how we kind of train like <laughs> learning Which algorithms. we force people to do, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem so. with CAPTCHAs, right? <laughs> so should we force people to donate a little bit of effort to Twitch Plays Robotics? Again, that's a social question. I'm just a scientist. I don't know. <laughs> Thank Good you. question. So is it going to be possible to prioritize certain social responses over others. It doesn't uh, matter if 100 people don't think that hurts. If your patient does, that's an issue. That's it. So do we weight everyone's vote? Do some people's votes have a greater weight than others? Again, you know how I'm going to respond to this question. It's a social issue. If we want to decide, we could say the people that are physically close to the robot have a greater say, but often, and again, I can't maybe think up a situation uh, off the top of my head, but there might be the situations where you're harmed by what a robot does and you're nowhere near the robot. The robot's bringing you your Amazon package and it throws it in the river for some crazy reason, who knows? Uh, maybe psychological harm in that case, but it's not easy, right? So who gets two votes and who gets only, only one vote? A hard thing to, to decide. I still keep coming back to this idea of that such a system replicates our best judgment and replicates our worst judgment. And amplifies it, not just replicates it. And amplifies it. Amplifies it. And I'm, I'm really hoping that AI and machines can do better than we did. Okay. Right? So um, it strikes me that maybe, to this gentleman's point earlier, you know, several of those robots were terminated not because they didn't necessarily move the furthest or were able to move the furthest, but because unfair obstacles were put in their way. Okay. So how do you allow such a system to have a, 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 a divergent point of view, a, um, an experimental point of view okay. that might yield something better than just our approval? That's, that's a really good question. So. You're, you're delineating one possibility. So there is the democratic approach, we just give everyone a vote. There is the other approach, which is companies in Silicon Valley decide what's going to be a safe autonomous car and what isn't. Or we let the machines have a say in the value system, right? What is of value and what isn't? Someone mentioned the value system before. This is another related problem in AI known as the value alignment problem. So humans, generally speaking, we, we have certain values we more or less agree on. Again, we're not always unanimous. And we're directing those common values at these machines in this way. But the machines might come up with values of their own. They might have their own value system. And the scientific question is, how would you get the machines to align their values with human values? That's a very tricky problem. If we could, then absolutely, in my opinion, we should allow the machines to have a say in things. But until we solve the value alignment problem, I don't want the robot autonomously deciding what go through the door safely means, right? I want to make sure that humans have the only say in what go through the door means. Uh, the control. I have the control. Um, you know, I, I, I'm listening to all these questions, but I think that too many questions are coming from inside the box instead of outside of the box. Okay. And um, I, this sounds like children when you think of it. 
I mean, we take children and they basically do the same things that you're doing with these robots. And it took us, um, you know, a couple of thousand years or tens of thousands of years to go through these iterations to be able to get them right. Now, what I'm thinking is that um, why not, why are humans doing this? Why aren't we creating robots, autonomous robots that could be trained by other forms of AI to go through these iterations many, many more times quickly? And therefore, we could have one type of AI directing other types of, of robotics uh, which would go through these iterations, set up parameters, and the, the AI is telling the robot, do this or do this, don't do this, because it knows what would be allowable and not allowable in, in a less adaptive way. Perhaps, but now you have to make sure that the AI's value that's telling the robot, do this, don't do that, you need to make sure the AI's value aligns with human values and how are you going to ensure that those two value systems align? It, it may be possible. I'm just saying this is a big, a big open problem in, in AI. It's not impossible. It's a good yeah, idea. But, but I, you see what I'm saying? I, I'm saying that, that something that, is more, that, we, that we know more about could be training something that we know less about. So back to the car that only is allowed to go at 0, 20, or 40 miles per hour. Let's decide as a society we're only going to try and teach these things, right? So one of the difference between robots and human children is human children whether we like it or not, are going to grow up into complex machines. They're going to be able to do a lot of things. Now, whether what they do aligns with what their parents or society thinks they should do, I don't know. We don't have any control over that. But with robots, we do. We could force them to be very simple, that there are only certain things that they can do, and those things tend to produce unanimous votes. People tend to agree because the machines are simple, and what we're asking them to do is simple. So that's one approach. Keep everything simple, in which case we might get more social consensus. Uh, how big are the neural networks? Let's see. Um, they are very small by today's standards, so I think the worm bot here has 18 neurons inside, and I can't do the math in my head, but 60 or 70 synapses, whereas okay, we have 10 to the 14 synapses. I'm, you know, I, I gave up on Godelesh or Bach. I feel like less of a man. Uh, but, but, we've but all been I there. Mean, we've all I, been but there. But I'm, I'm hip deep in, in Kurzweil right now. Okay. So the singularity from about five years ago. So Sure. I'm always right on top of things. <laughs> but he talks about human neural nets in, and he, you know, because he's such a freaking show off with his organs and stuff. He talks, he, he's always in scientific notation. And, and he's talking 10 to the 16 neurons. You know, you think maybe you got a little bit of a, a, a I think it gets better as it scales. I mean, if, you know, that's, that's and I, I go at, you know, go nuts. You know? A lot of my colleagues suffer from that disease known as neurochauvinism, right? So. <laughs> Let's put, 10, let's put 10 to the 14 synapses inside Wormbot, and surely it will be able to... Stop calling, stop calling me Shirley. Stop calling me Shirley. There you go. Okay. Okay, I guess that's the thing going on. Yeah, it's me. Okay, oh, I can just talk. Lisa, yeah. yes. Since we're on the topic of the neural networks... Uh oh, um, this is might, an expert asking this question. I don't know about that. I'm in that trouble. Might have just answered, you might have just uh, answered the question I had, but I was thinking about how much the... Uh, the learning of the language might scale, so I was wondering if, so you can learn like move forward, move backward, move left, move right. Can you learn move from those four commands and build like that implicit representation there? Or okay, so that's a good question. the outputs on your network, I guess. That's a really good question. So that's a question about language, right? So forget safety for a moment. How much of human language could machines learn in this way if they had large enough neural networks and we had big enough computers? We're lucky at UVM that we have a, a supercomputer with about 3,000 cores, so not bad, not Google scale, but not bad, right? How far could we get? Uh, again, I have no idea, but that's, we have a funded project in the lab to try and answer that question. If a machine can learn move and turn left, could the next machine learn move then turn left? What does the word T-H-E-N mean? That word for humans is often pretty simple, but for a machine, it's much harder to connect T-H-E-N with physical experience than it is to connect J-U-M-P with physical experience. 
So maybe as it starts to build up an understanding of language and grounds it in the soil of physical experience, it can then move up to more abstract ideas like then. I talk about this with my students at UVM and say, well, let's really think big. If we could get a robot to learn jump and a whole bunch of other words, could a robot learn what the idiom don't jump to conclusions means? <laughs> if you have a friend and their, uh, their English is not their native tongue, try don't jump to conclusions on them. And if they haven't heard it before, they can usually figure out what that idiom means without you explaining it to them. How can they do that, right? They've never, it's kind of a weird thing when you think about it. Despite whatever your mother tongue is, we all know what it feels like to jump. When you jump, you sort of leave something, and if you're jumping forward, sometimes you skip over things. We have sort of a connection between jump and, you know, this idea that you can then connect with the very abstract idea of jumping over chains in a logical argument, and your friend is saying, don't do that, don't jump to conclusions. Whether we'll get there, I, I don't know. Um, something to think about. I know there's a couple more questions, but maybe this is a good time to move on to the social part of the evening. Um, thanks very much for your great questions and attention. <laughs> <laughs>